Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar hosted by the Center for Open Science. Uh, today, we'll be discussing the efforts to catalyze open science globally and our movement to provide translated help guides into users' native languages all around the world. You'll be hearing from some passionate translators who will share why they put the time and effort into translating our onboarding resources. You'll also hear their stories about how open science is seen, used, and adopted in their communities. My name is Daniel Steger. I'm the engagement lead here at the Center for Open Science. And over the past year, uh, we have been working with a group of researchers to help translate our help guides uh, that support the understanding of the open science framework. Our help center, uh, help.osf.io, which I will put into chat right now, uh, that will link uh, to our chat over uh, houses over 200 help guides uh, to help introduce the open science framework. Uh, the speakers you meet today have helped bring these help guides to researchers in their native languages that are not English. Uh, we will be speaking, uh, they will speak to uh, why they translate these help guides and share their stories and the impact that these help guides have had on the open science framework in general and their communities. Uh, as a reminder, this webinar will be recorded and shared with uh, throughout our YouTube channel. Uh, we encourage you to answer or and ask questions into the chat feature and discuss. Uh, our team members will be monitoring the chat and encourage group discussions uh, throughout the chat. Now, it kind of goes without saying, uh, everyone should be respectful and responding to others. The format of the webinar is as follows. Each speaker will be given roughly seven minutes to talk about their experience and their stories. Uh, we'll have a COS representative speak about the Center for Open Science Global Priority Initiatives. We'll be hosting a question and answer at the end of the presentation. So again, please enter your questions into the Zoom chat feature, uh, and we'll pick some of the questions to close out the webinar. Additionally, if you're interested in volunteering as a translator, I'll be posting a form into the chat, uh, and you can sign up throughout the webinar. Now, this will be a little bit of fun uh, as I'm still working out how to send a uh, chat feature into the Zoom thing, but we wanted to start with a little bit of an activity, kind of see where everybody is showing up from. So our first question, where are you watching from? So you have two options to do this. You can scan the QR code um, or I will try and find a way to provide a link. Now you can scan the QR code with your phone uh, but it will basically give you a page that looks something like this, a map. Now on this map, up in the top right-hand corner, you will see a little plus button. All we want you to do is type in what city you are watching this from, from around the world, uh, and then click publish. Uh, that way we can kind of get a little bit of a global ideals of here is all the different places that we are viewing this webinar from. Awesome. I'll let you guys continue on uh, adding where you're from. Uh, but at this time, I'm actually going to pass the metaphorical mic over to our first translator, uh, Felipe. He is one of our new translators uh, who are helping out with the uh, Portuguese translations. So I'm going to stop sharing. And Felipe, you can start. Hi, Daniel. Thank you. I would try to share my screen here. Just a second. Can you see it like in the full screen? Yeah, that's great. So hi, everyone. Good morning here in Brazil. Well, um, my name is Felipe Villanova. I'm a professor at the Universidade La Salle in Southern Brazil, and I'm also a PhD candidate at the Catholic University here in the state of Rio Grande do Sul in Southern Brazil as well. And um, I'm a psychologist. I, my PhD is on social psychology, so I work on social psychology. And I will be talking about our experiences here with this translation initiative. And um, I also have to say that we got engaged in this initiative through the Society for the Improvement of Psychological Science, the SIPS, S-I-P-S here, because I am the co-chair along with Annabelle, who will be speaking after me here, 
uh, we are co-chairing the IDEA committee, which is a subcommittee within SIPS. And IDEA stands for Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Access. So we thought that we could increase the access to open science through some uh, initiatives, including this translation initiative, which Daniel was kind enough to move forward with this idea and this suggestion. So I will be talking about it a little bit here. Well, uh, I would like to first acknowledge our translators. We counted with the help of a lot of translators and uh, these translators here, they engaged very actively in the translation from the help guides uh, to Chinese and to Portuguese as well. So I was not working alone on the Portuguese translation. I was working with my colleague, Tiago Rafael Santin. And uh, we had our three amazing translators to Chinese which I won't try to say their names because I cannot speak Chinese, but well, I would like to acknowledge their work here and they did an amazing job and you can check out their translations in our website, in this website of the COS. Well, um, I will just briefly talk about my efforts and why I decided to engage in this initiative. And it's basically because uh, I talked a lot about open science and the benefits of open science with my colleagues. Here are some pictures of the members of the research groups that I have participated and some uh, colleagues as well. And I always talked about open science and said, hey, this is cool. Look what we can do in the, within the open science framework. Uh, you should definitely do that, especially because some journals, some international journals, they are willing to accept articles from the Global South that are um, using these open science resources. So uh, I often talked about it with a lot of people, but then everybody had the same challenge, which was basically getting started on the OSF homepage. They basically like signed in, they got in, they made an account and then they created this project. But when they got into this screen, they were like, OK, what the hell should I do now? And then they didn't know what to do because first they were not familiar with pre-registration, with preprints, with uploading materials. They didn't know um, how to do that. And the OSF help guides are all in English. And we have 200 million people here in Brazil. And most of people here cannot speak English. And they were like, well, why should I engage in this initiative if even the help guides aren't helping me and aren't talking like directly to me in my language? So people wouldn't like try to learn English just to learn how to go through the OSF website. So we thought, well, you know, maybe if, if we had a help guide in Portuguese, people would be willing to use the open science framework more and benefit from the resources of open science that we have embedded in the website. So uh, um, we got lost. This was the feeling, you know, lost in translation because people got there, they were like, okay, where should I go? And the platform, like the, the, the template is not the most friendly as possible. So we do need the help guides. And then we thought, well, you know, it could be really useful to have a, a help guide in Portuguese. So this is basically why uh, I got engaged on this problem, on, on this initiative and trying to do that. So the good news is that right now we do have the OSF help guides. And I think that the main objective of this webinar here is to show you that they are available now and you can use it. We do have this in Portuguese, Spanish and Chinese right now. So uh, we do have reasons to celebrate now. And this is basically what I had to say. My brief, my short communication is just about it, but I'm looking forward to the questions and answers afterward. So this is basically what I had to say. Wonderful. Thank you, Felipe. That was a really great summary of kind of where we were getting started. Um, I'm going to pass uh, the screen over to Annabelle, uh, who is another one of our uh, newer translators uh, who helped create a getting started guide for Espanol. Thanks, Daniel. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Annabelle Belaus. I'm from Cordoba, Argentina. Um, I'm a doctor in psychology, also working on social psychology and uh, behavioral economics, mostly. Um, and I'm a postdoc researcher here at the National University of Córdoba, also in Argentina. Um, so uh, I'm also a co-chair with, uh, with Felipe in the IDEA Committee of SIPS. 
I also work in the, um, I mean, uh, collaborate in the Translation and Cultural Diversity Committee in the Psychological Science Accelerator. And um, I have uh, collaborated also with uh, some big science, uh, big team uh, efforts in, in uh, research as a translator also or coordinator of translation. And um, I was thinking like, okay, I'm doing a lot of translations <laughs> and I'm not a translator, I'm a psychology. But the thing is that um, I, I, I started with open science and I fell in love with it. I, I really like all the proposals and I try to move forward the movement here in Argentina. And I got some enthusiasm that uh, people like, like what Felipe was saying, people get like freeze. Like they try, they like the idea, but they do not get really started. Um, and I believe it is, it is a matter of access, of course, uh, and language is very important on, on that matter. Um, but I was thinking that of course, we can use like, for example, Google Translator or, or any tool like that. And maybe people can get through the, the platform. But the thing is that it, it is not only about access, but also about feeling welcome, right? If people um, try to use the platform that they do not know with new practices and everything is another in another the language is like okay we are not supposed to be here right we are this is not for us so i believe that translating the materials the, the help guide and, and everything helps in access because many people do not speak english and they should be able to to use it but also for people from another languages to feel like okay yeah i'm supposed to be here I can use this tool and, and, and collaborate and have a voice on it. So that's the main reason I, I'm putting so much time on translation matters, um, because I do believe that it will help people to join the movement. And then we will be able to have um, another discussions, right? Like, like moving the, the, the discussion forward. Um, so yeah, here in Argentina, just um, to, yeah, I don't have the word in English, but it doesn't matter. Um, in Argentina, we have a law that uh, states that every, um, all research funded by national and public funds should share the raw data, right? And the law is uh, working since uh, 2013. But the thing is that we do not have enough infrastructure for that. So researchers uh, want to share the, the, the data and, and everything. And that is because we have the law. And also because uh, I don't know if you are uh, familiar with the uh, educational and academic system in Argentina, but it's mostly public and free as is funded by the national government. So we have a very strong culture of giving back to society. So for us, uh, it, it is very important to share. Uh, but the thing is that we do not have the infrastructure in Argentina is uh, undergoing to an economical crisis right now and for some years now. So I do not believe that it will be, that the infrastructure will be ready. So in that terms also, um, having people using OSF and similar platforms will help us to uh, be able to share, right? Um, and science communicators, policy makers, everybody will be able to, to access. Um, I haven't checked my time, so I'm not sure how am I going. Yeah, I think you're, you're good. Um, thank you so uh, much for... Uh, your your stories and your in, uh, your insight into why you were going about the translations. Um, so at this time, I'm going to actually transition over to some of our original translators, uh, especially in Espanol. We have had translations of our help guides before. 
um, and uh, Raphael and Nestor are in a really unique situation where they helped translate these help guides, but they got to see the effect of that translation on their research community. So I'm not going to say any more, um, but I'll let them take over from here. Thanks, Daniel. And thanks for inviting us. Hola, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good night. It's, it's nice to see that everyone is connected around the world. And, and that's kind of the point. We have been, as Daniel said, uh, supporting the cause, COS, for a long time. Uh, every project that we get involved in, uh, that I get involved in in Colombia, uh, I always uh, uh, tell them to start using OSF as soon as possible to reap the benefits as soon as possible. And like Daniel said, we have been able to even measure the effects of using OSF. Um, so we'll tell you a little bit about that in the context of a project that we're working on right now, which is on cancer research and how we have used or, or why we have used OSF and why we have taken the time and the effort and the resources uh, to do translations, not only of uh, help guides, but also of specific scenarios. So it's important what Annabelle was saying, that people feel welcome. So it's not only in your language, but it's uh, I'm talking to you, researcher, from this project uh, in this specific scenario. Uh, Nestor, can you help me with the next slide? So briefly, this is what we do. It's translational cancer research. We start from the very beginning, identifying plants that have potential treatment, uh, mostly because they have traditionally been used by people for treating cancer, but, uh, but they're not used systematically. We're not exactly sure why they work. We're not exactly sure in combination of which other plants or other uh, drugs, what effects could happen. Uh, so that's what we start doing. We do cell and molecular research on the plants to characterize exactly what they're made of and what their properties are and what the potentials they have in different uh, ways of treating cancer. If that works out, then we go into uh, trials with animals. If that works out, then we go into network pharmacology, which, which is trying to figure out how well our compounds do against other compounds that have been published. And this is where open data is critical to uh, be able to share our results and compare them with other results. If that works out, then there's a promise to develop a new drug and we scale it up. We have to do it in a way that is quality and standard. So it all has to be transparent. We need to keep uh, traceability of all the data that we're generating. If that works out, then we go into uh, clinical trials. Of course, after the pandemic, we're all experts on how that works. Um, so that's what we do. Uh, and that takes uh, a lot of data. It requires a lot of data, which is shared across a lot of places. And then if that works out, we go into final approval on market. So what that implies, Nestor, can you help me with the next one? Is that we need a lot of people to get that done. And these people are uh, international universities. It's our university, Javeriana in Bogota, Colombia. It's other, many other universities uh, within Colombia. It's research centers, it's industry, the pharma industry, which will take care of the final steps. And it's also NGOs, which help us from the uh, beginning of the chain, which is when we're working with the, the actual farmers, agriculture, to do this in a sustainable way, to do this in a way that is uh, good for the environment and that can create alternative ways of generating resources from Colombia besides you know, coal and petroleum. So that's what we do. And that implies that we have a diversity of uh, locations, diversity of disciplines, diversity in data, diversity in language. And our uh, idea is to use OSF to support this whole infrastructure. And our concern is how do we get people to adopt and accept the technology? And then we're uh, for sure coming from the same place as Felipe and Annabelle. So uh, now I'll let Nestor tell a little bit more details of, of what we have actually done to translate the resources. Okay, can you see my 
screen? Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. So, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Nestor Roa. I'm an assistant professor at Haverian University. Um, I'm a doctor in engineering, in engineering focused on information systems. Uh, and I spend many of my time researching on how to improve collaboration and coordination for managing uh, information uh, and for sharing knowledge in large projects, uh, such as the one um, that Rafael just presented, the GAT project. Uh, and actually, that's why I'm here uh, speaking about OSF and why we consider it um, a powerful infrastructure to reach uh, these goals of coordination and knowledge management. So as we are discussing in this webinar, uh, the help guys, and in particular, the help guys in Spanish in our case, are an essential tool enabling the use of OSF by the research community. So in the case of GAT, well, uh, we manage several information such as data sets, experimental information, reports, papers, books, among other uh, kind of products. And uh, obviously this, impli this implies to uh, pay particular attention to the way we organize the whole information to further retrieve it and analyze it. And so we need a full, in a full understanding of the platform. So in our research project, we have um, the main goal to produce like uh, 300 uh, research papers, uh, some books, some trade secrets like formulas, procedures, designs, um, processes, but also uh, another kind of product. So there are a bunch of information that uh, we need to manage every day and actually uh, every, every second. So because experimental information is sparking uh, with, with uh, each uh, experiment in the, in the laboratory. So our help guys have been crucial to facilitate the information managing process at technical and managerial level. So in OSF, we have uh, several components uh, related with experimental uh, trials, but also we have several components uh, about finan financial information of each project, uh, but also uh, reports uh, that uh, each um, uh, principal research must produce uh, every two months and so on. In this sense, and as Rafael mentioned, this is a large project. We are like 125 researchers from 20 different institutions around the world. And most of the, our people speak Spanish and work in Spanish. That's, that's for real. So that's why we record it. And I mean, we use uh, help guys in Spanish as the most important tool to promote and to uh, distribute information about OSF. So in that, in that sense and with, uh, with this challenge, so we recorded uh, 16 videos in Spanish uh, in a real mode, you know, like short videos of three or four minutes at most, explaining the different functions of the platform. And uh, we also translate the user manual in, in Spanish. So as you can see in this uh, screen, we have a folder with videos about the general use of OSF, but also we have uh, the, manual, the manual in Spanish. So this is the main uh, uh, tool that we use to uh, teach about OSF in our community. So um, our help guys have been crucial to facilitate the information managing process at technical and managerial level. Um, and in this course of training, uh, our GAT community, our research community in OSF, we realized that we also might consider um, three important, important factors when catalyzing open science in GAT. So the first factor is that uh, the videos about functionality of OSF are important to learn about the platform, but, uh, but also is necessary another resources uh, in order to navigate our research project. So as I said before, we have plenty of projects 
a bunch of components, several information in the platform. And obviously it really makes uh, really increased complexity when we try to navigate in that ocean of information. And so we decided to guide our research colleagues through different access paths toward technical, administrative, and general information of our project. And we also this, uh, did uh, this guidance on videos. So we have videos about functionality of OSF and videos about how to navigate our research project in Spanish. The second factor is that um, in this way of using the, the help guys um, as a mediator or facilitator of the learning process about OSF, uh, we also realized that in large projects like that, like our research project, it is necessary to define a role such, an as, such as uh, an advisor or maybe a consultant which would reinforce the appropriation of, of OSF by the research community. So the translated help guys. Plus advising is the formula that has worked in GATT. And the last factor um, is that in our experience using OSF, um, we have defined a simple but an effective learning path. For example, when a new student or maybe a new researcher or a new consultant enrolled in GATT, they first explore the videos in Spanish and then they meet with us, with Rafael and I, for more specific guidance. Sometimes um, the first step with videos is enough. So they learn how to use OSF just with videos and maybe just with the manual. But sometimes Rafael and I uh, closely interact with the community in, in order to reinforce or make uh, uh, make a specific train training process uh, in, in OSF. So we have a procedure which indicates that um, the translated help guys are valuable in establishing establishing a baseline of knowledge about OSF and then uh, being able to move it up. So that's so uh, Daniel, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you both so much. Um, so our translated help guides are part of a global initiative, um, part of our priorities. Uh, so I'm actually gonna pass it over to our chief product officer, Nikki, and she can talk a little bit more about some of COS's other initiatives. Yes, thanks Daniel very much. Sorry, I'm the Zoom button is in the way, of course. Um, okay. Yeah, so just a couple of, of things. First off, a big thank you. Uh, one, to all of the panelists, but all the attendees that are here live and those that will hopefully watch this recording in time. Um, just thank you for your, your continued advocacy of open science. I think we're a, a community that is brought together for that purpose um, and really uh, appreciate your demonstration of the utility of OSF through your research and your usage. But even beyond that, it's your commitment to making open science um, something that you uh, bring to others that you're collaborating with um, and really uh, supporting their learning about um, sort of the principles, but then how you actually implement that into your workflows and leverage open infrastructure and tools that are out there. Um, I think that that um, is something that is just extremely valuable and beneficial, um, probably beyond what you even realize today, how that will carry on um, and pay dividends for, for those colleagues and their colleagues, colleagues, you know, it just, it'll continue to carry forward. So that's um, something to just, just to really appreciate about the things you're doing and you're in, and, and it's, and it's time that you're taking outside of your day to day, which is, which is really amazing. Um, and, and really the support that you've given uh, to these translated guides and videos to really lower that barrier of entry. I think you are, are paying it forward in a way that, you know, you got in and figured it out. Um, and, and now you don't want that same level of effort to have to be for the next researcher to come behind you or to work with you alongside you. And I think that's just an amazing, um, yeah, thing that you're adding to society. Um, and then I think being here today to kind of join and represent um, 
your your uh, interests and your activities for this community to help advance open science globally. I just really wanted to say thank you and how much um, we at COS appreciate that. Um, but it's really about um, what research is global and COS and OSF are here to support open science uh, efforts across across the globe. And, you know, we have the open infrastructure with OSF and it's free for researchers. It's open source. It's something that um, we hope to enable both you know, users that want to come and 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 take advantage of of an account and and uploading content and materials um, to share and collaborate, but also the consumers that don't need an account to come and view your research, the data that you're sharing, um, that your teams are producing, that are part of these advancements in in cures and knowledge um, that you're that you're putting out there. You know, even those consumers are are participating all across the globe, and they can participate. And, and experience all of this across the research life cycle. So even early stage um, collaboration and study planning protocols and all those things all the way to the very end where you've got your final data and your final report and analysis and your preprints and your publications, all those good things. But the whole process being open is, is really what open science is all about. And it's something that you're demonstrating and making available. Um, so I just thank you. And, and it's something that we hope to support. Um, we're, we're actively engaging with diverse stakeholders and communities to help catalyze the open science movement. And really, it's, 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 it's researchers like you that are demonstrating the value um, and, and the transparency that is really bringing that out there for others to interrogate and to, you know, really look at retrospectively to say, is this something that I could start to do? I could start to participate in. And again, I know we have different regional policies and requirements and all of those things are changing over time, but I think seeing it happening in real time is, is a benefit to, to all of, all of the research ecosystem. Um, and some of the things that um, we are actively trying to do with our partners um, is to have a more global reach and to engage partners across the world um, around um, infrastructure, but also the advocacy and policy work. So that is uh, something that uh, we're, we're interested in, in speaking with you, learning about those needs and goals and how we can help support that, but also the training um, and advocacy work that you're doing. So within your communities is something we also aim to support. So sharing these out here in this webinar, putting those links on our YouTube and, and embedding those translated resources here for others to discover. Um, but anything in that uh, place that we can help offer, just let us know. And I think more about where the OSF is going and some of the features and functionality that we hope to continue to improve and offer to support um, more global usage. So one is metadata that's, that's critically important to the full sort of uh, fairness and impact that research can have. And so metadata about where data was was taken or um, the language that it's in, um, any of the content, that is something that we are, um, it's on our roadmap for the last half of this year. And it's something we hope to be offering very, very soon, um, as well as um, the changes we're making to the platform to move into a, a more modern updated framework for our front end, um, which includes the ability to translate all of our pages. So we're about 75% done with moving those pages into the new framework. And once we do that, we'll be able to work with communities to translate those pages. So the way that OSF and all of the um, you know, buttons and everything are in English right now, you'll be able to see those in, in all, the, all the languages that we can get translated uh, versions for. So that's really exciting and something that we're really close to. Uh, we've been tracking this for a while and been actively working on this page by page. We just released a couple new page uh, redesigns for files. So that just brought us a couple more pages closer. So we have about 15 pages left, which is only about 25% of the site left to go. So that's exciting. So hopefully a lot more to come and more engagement there to start translating all of OSF. Um, and really just, just wanted to kind of say, you know, how else could we help support um, the global needs for open research? And that's something that I know Daniel is always uh, ready to hear and to, to, to ask those questions and to hear from users and stakeholders across the world. So um, please feel free to jump to, to drop any of those in the chat as well. That's something we can we can uh, take take in now. And then um, if you provide some email, we'll, we'll be happy to follow up and even learn more about how we could advance in those areas. So that's kind of all I had. Daniel, I'll turn it back to you. Yeah, and I think that's a fantastic way for us to start the Q&A session is to kind of lead it off by, okay, we are translating some of our help guides. We're creating getting started guides. 
Um, but if you have an opinion on that in the chat, feel free to add this, but I'm gonna open that up to the panel. How else could we support users both getting started and establish users on the OSI in different languages? Felipe, why don't you start? I think that through funding, funding is a really important issue that normally isn't talked about because there is like a lot of funding for research in the global north, especially in Europe and the US. But um, usually there are some barriers when trying to fund um, projects that are outside. And these are like a lot of barriers. People say, oh, we don't have the infrastructure to that because it involves a lot of international law and this money, you know, delivering money, sending money to other countries. There is a specific legislation regarding it. But anyways, I think that the lack of funding is something um, really important that really impairs these uh, open science initiatives here because uh, we cannot always rely on volunteer work especially because the workload is huge for everybody and we people are not willing to like collaborate voluntarily forever and then there i think it reaches a point where people say well you know i'm not getting anything for it like concrete benefits in my career or something like that so they just give up on trying even though, of course, uh, we could have advantages in trying to publish and getting access to these international journals that are really aiming to expand the open science initiatives. So we could consider this a benefit for the career of the person or whatever. But I think that the lack of funding for these initiatives, it's a really important issue because, you know, we just have, at least I don't know anybody in the Global South who received money to foster global science initiatives it's usually the opposite we have to put our uh, money out of our pockets to like expand this initiative so i would say that this is a really important barrier in this sense thank you does anyone else have uh, a take on how else we can support um, both translations and uh, your communities in general Rafael. Yeah, so I fully agree with Felipe that certain things have to be done at the structural macro level in terms of funding or in terms of what Annabel mentioned, in terms of regulation, even forcing projects to use open platforms and publish their data transparently. If it's publicly funded, that makes sense that it's uh, that that's the way to do it. But at the same time, of course, it should have an infrastructure to support that. Uh, provided publicly as well. But there's also uh, little things that can be done because at, at the other end, there are researchers that are, aren't fully uh, aware uh, or even motivated to move into the digital realm. Still, uh, there are these kinds of researchers around. Um, for instance, in our project, there are uh, several researchers and, and not all of them are the older researchers. It's a cultural issue, uh, which rely on notebooks for their lab work. And it's simply because it's more comfortable for them to use uh, a notebook surrounded by machines and microscopes and uh, uh, whatever, uh, tubes, et cetera, to say, I, I have my little notebook, that's where I uh, register my data. It's even a structured notebook, so I have the date of my experiment, uh, all the fields are there. I simply take a few seconds and I write it down with my hand. So do you actually expect me to open up my laptop and uh, log into OSF and upload a document to register my experiments? Um, no, thanks. I'll, I'll keep using my notebook. And uh, for instance, I said, well, what, what if you lose your notebook? Never. <laughs> that has never happened. It will never happen. So it's, a, it's simply a, a cultural barrier. Yeah, it's, I, I don't trust OSF more than I trust my notebook. You know, what if I, my account gets hacked uh, and, and I don't really have a response for that because it could happen, you know, uh, uh, but it's not, it's not better to have a notebook. So what we try to do in this case is we try to uh, close the distance between the two. So we said, okay, you can keep using your notebook, but here's this nice little notebook that allows us to then uh, scan a QR code. And this is automatically in sync with a digital notebook. 
And then you just say, I'm going to uh, upload that into Google Drive or Dropbox or whatever you like, and it automatically goes into OSF. So keep using your notebook. You just uh, take one more second to take a picture and, and it will be automatically in sync. Uh, we haven't followed up on that, but of, a lot of researchers were excited to do it uh, this way. So it's another uh, little things that can be done. Fantastic. Um, so I'm going to switch it up just a little bit. I'm going to take a user question and I'm going to actually uh, give this to Annabelle because I think we've actually had almost a direct conversation on this one. Um, I had gone to Italy a few uh, weeks ago, but I don't speak Italian. Uh, so how I got by was I used tools like Google Translate where I would ask, you know, where is the bathroom? Where is food? Where is whatever? Um, but I brought that back to the translation team and asked, you know, why, why can't we just use Google Translate for all of our translation needs? Why do we need translators? Um, so kind of in your opinion, why, why would I need a translator versus, uh, say, some of these tools like Google Translate? Um, well, on, on one hand, I believe it is uh, about what I was saying before, like, uh, most people can use Google Translator, fine, but um, why? <laughs> it's like, it takes time. Uh, you have to copy, print, uh, and then go back to the platform. And um, it, like, it's annoying, right? And of course, people can do it, but it's not the same experience. And also, of course, Google Translator uh, helps a lot, but has also a lot of uh, mistakes. And sometimes it is not the correct translation. So having people translating the, the, the materials makes you um, read like somebody's talking to you, right? Somebody's explaining it to you with no errors, hopefully. And so I believe it's a, it's a big difference. Like Google Translator... Um, should be like the last resource, right? Like, okay, there's nothing else we can do right now. We can use Google Translator, but um, I do believe it is, it is just very important to have translations, like um, friendly translations. Fantastic. Uh, Felipe, did you also want to add to that? And just a, a small, I, I was in Italy as well, and then we can use like Google Translator. And then one thing is when the person says, "Oh, you should go to the right," or they say, "Yeah, yeah, that's right." But when they start speaking a lot of things, there is no Google Translator that will work because when they start saying "Ma bene, ma come faccio per avere," we can we can understand it. And it's a bit like the the work that we are doing here because we are not able to like understand everything. If we copy and paste everything in Google Translator, a lot of weird things will come up. Up. So we're like, yeah, it's impossible to rely on these translations all of the time. And you know, this, Annabelle said something really interesting. Um, one thing is like when you occasionally have to use Google Translator, people who speak English, they would have occasionally have to do this, you know, translate. Stuff. But we who are not like native English speakers, we have to do it all of the time if we are using international resources. So it's a, a very different experience. Nobody likes to rely on Google Translator all of the time. So yeah, I'll just make this small addition. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, okay. So I'm going to actually uh, send this over to our original translators. Um, a user wrote in saying uh, language is obviously a major barrier for adopting open science culture. Um, are there any other barriers that uh, users from these geographic locations have experienced as far as getting adopted into open science? Uh, you had talked a little bit about cultural uh, stuff, Raphael, but is there anything else? Sure, uh, we're, we're experiencing one right now. As, as you saw, uh, our project is supposed to end in actual development of new drugs and, uh, and secrets and patents. And this is all protected, uh, but we don't know when or if it will be protected. So several researchers are afraid to publish early data if they don't know whether it can or should be 
protected later on. Uh, so that's a major concern. Uh, of course, we can close it up. It's, it's as simple as that. And that's how we have done it. Simply, we're using OSF and it's open for us, but not for anyone else. Uh, and as soon as the project ends, then, we, and as soon as we've made a decision whether this would be a secret or a patent, then we will open it up. So it's as easy as that from a technical point of view, but from a cultural point of view, the simple fact that I'm putting it in a platform uh, openly, regardless of whether it's uh, protected through permissions, uh, that makes some researchers weary. Wonderful. I'll open that up to uh, the rest of the group. Um, do you see any other barriers for adopting either the open science framework or open science in general within your communities? I think that the advantages are not clear. Um, as we talked before, I think that People, uh, specifically here in Brazil, would benefit a lot because, for example, the Brazilian journals, they have this very strict page limit of like 25 pages usually. And uh, a lot of, really often people want to disclose the instruments that they used in this manuscript. So you would have, I don't know, 25 pages is the limit. You would have only 20 pages because five pages would be only to um, provide the instrument that they used. And when we use OSF, we would have 25 pages because we could just upload it to OSF and provide the link in, in the paper, in the manuscript. But people aren't, they don't really know about it. So I think it's like uh, they don't have access to the information. And I think that, of course, this is related to the language issue, but a lot of times this is like a lack of information though. And when it, when people don't talk about it, they don't know that it exists. So the information isn't getting there, you know, it isn't reaching people out there. So I would say that um, this is a, an issue as well. And just uh, a small thing that uh, we also have the same issues that uh, people have in other places about adopting open science, right? Like the recognitions from the um, societies or, or who, whoever is evaluating scientists uh, here in Argentina is not valued to like it doesn't matter if you pre-register or whatever um, it is not um, important if you participated in a big team science project like so, so it's the same discussion that uh, other geographical areas have um, but with like the problem that because it is in another language, we, we cannot even start the, the discussion. So uh, just that. Yeah, Nestor, you yeah. or oh, Rafael also. <laughs> I have a couple of uh, comments. So when we start uh, three years ago, analyzing how to introduce OSF in our research project, we make a little analysis regarding the age of the target population. So we have we have bunch of young people. I could say I could say like eighty percent is, is is young people. Is under thirties maybe, and another percentage is older people. So uh, actually, that difference uh, in age that uh, was the reason, the main reason we. Uh, translate the users, the user manual uh, to Spanish because uh, many of people prefer to read a manual, a writing manual, and uh, use it like a, a, as a guidance. But young people, you know, prefer videos, prefer short videos, prefer um, simple stuff to, to learn about technology. So that's why we. Um, consider as a strategy to divide the the help guys uh, in in this in this um, uh, two ways um, and that's that's an important point we also uh, find in our project so there are many people um, that 
easily accept OSF and adopt uh, OSF in, in a short time, but there are other people that take, uh, take more time to, uh, to use it. Um, and again, it depends on, on the, the, the edge, it depends on uh, trust about OSF, but also trust about technology. Um, and it depends on some misconceptions about open, open science. So what, what we uh, understand in, in our project is that uh, technology, I mean, OSF is important. We, we can train people using OSF, but as a third step, we need to explain what is open science before uh, explain the, the platform. That's, I mean, we consider that that, that is the correct, uh, the correct or the, or the appropriate uh, procedure to introduce OSF. So that's all. Thank you. Uh, Rafael, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, maybe present the other side of the question, which is, uh, why have people actually accepted it? Not, not what barriers we have encountered it, but why people actually uh, get excited about OSF. And it's very simple, but powerful stuff. Uh, obviously it's free, that helps a lot. Um, it's fast, so literally you get people, you wanna start using it? Uh, let's take 30 seconds and you'll start using it. You can create a project from zero, from scratch, in 30 seconds. So they say, oh, that's it. That's, so it's not as complicated once you start using it. They love that it's tech neutral. So even within projects, people who have been working for years, uh, one of them uses Dropbox, the other one uses Drive. This is, that, that's the way it goes. You know, I, we all have multiple accounts even. So they, they love this fact that they can be uh, easily integrated. And they also like the fact that it's sustainable. So this is, part of the issue about infrastructure. Uh, sometimes projects actually get funding for infrastructure, for data, but as long as the project is going. And then once the project ends, the funding stops and then uh, the server is turned off or there is no more uh, money to pay the cloud storage, et cetera. So this OSF uh, somewhat guarantees that the project will live on for at least a few years. And this is very important. That's actually a great pivot to kind of my last message. Um, does anyone else have anything that maybe you would say that take home message to uh, users who are getting started on the OSF, but maybe need a little bit of help? How would you go about talking to them and convincing them to use the OSF? Well, I will refer to the help guides that are now translated. So this is a good initiative. This is the first step. But then I think that um, related to what Rafael said, we can also start implementing it in our with our students and people who participate in our research groups. Because I remember that the first time that I used OSF was because my former co-advisor, I needed a data set. And then he said, well, you know, I can give you the data set if you pre-register your hypothesis. So that's, I had to do it. Otherwise he wouldn't like send me the data set that I needed. So we can start using some strategies like that to make people use, because once you have used it once, once you have done it once, then it's not as painful as the first time. So uh, I think that we could also, other than obviously, referring to the help guides, we could foster its use in our research labs or with our students because people would then, you know, um, incorporate it into their daily lives and their research um, activities. So I would say that this is a good step. Awesome. We may have time for maybe one more take home message or one more uh, argument that you would use to convince someone to use the OSF. Esther, Annabelle, if you're feeling good. All right. Um, well, in that case, we are almost at the top of the hour. Uh, I'd like to echo Nikki's statement about thank you. Um, one of the things that came up was recognition for our translators. That's something that we'll probably be talking about internally. Um, 
these webinars, they, they can't say thank you enough. You're helping a lot of people. Rafa, you have one more statement? <laughs> Yes. Uh, no. Thank you. Right back. And and this is important because we haven't mentioned it. We haven't been. We haven't felt alone in this process. We have always been communicating uh, with COS, and you guys have always been very helpful. So if more people want to get involved, you know that you will have people that are uh, behind you and beside you at all time. Absolutely. Um, so if you are interested in being a translator, I've posted the form in the chat a few times, or you can reach out to me directly uh, via email. Uh, we could set up a time to talk, just you and me. Um, in that case, uh, be on the lookout. We'll send a follow-up email um, about information from this webinar and be on the lookout for future COS webinars that are coming out. Um, thank you guys and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.